Coming up on this episode, Quinton Post, the 52nd overall pick in last month's draft, makes a strong start to his Warrior career as Golden State moved through to the semifinals of Summer League with another victory on Friday night, plus a quick look and a bit of clarity on the Larry Markin and contract situation as the Warriors continue their pursuit for the 2023 All-Star. Welcome back to the Golden State with Mates podcast. I am five to ten minutes removed from the final siren of my footy team's game this weekend where we lost by 11 goals. So Collingwood, we are the reigning premier still, and it looks like we're going to bow out uh, without even making the finals, which is nothing short of an absolute disaster. There's no doubt about that. It's the equivalent in NBA terms of the Boston Celtics coming out next season and not making the playoffs. So it's a disaster, albeit this kind of thing happens a little bit more in the AFL than the NBA. But yeah, I mean, there's five or six games left in the home and away season or the regular season, and it looks like our season is pretty much done and dusted, which is absolutely a horrible spot to be in when you enter the season with hopes that you might be able to go back to back or at least make a a strong, deep finals push kind of thing. So anyway, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to jump on and talk about something more positive, and that is the Warriors Summer League team, who have continued their hot form with a 90-83 victory over the Oklahoma City Thunder on Friday night, US time. Another strong performance, not as comfortable as the previous six, where five of those, they've had five victories by double digits. They had that uh, one-point win over the Sacramento Kings at the end of the California Classic And this was their only other game that you would say was very close. The Thunder tied the game with just over two minutes remaining. Warriors end the game on a 10-3 run, I think, over the last couple of minutes. Steadied themselves. Got the win, which catapults them to the semifinals against the Miami Heat, which will be on Sunday afternoon, US time, 6 a.m. Monday morning for me. So I'll be up up bright and early for that one. But the big uh, aspect to this game, of course, against the Thunder was the debut of 52nd overall pick in last month's draft, Quinton Post, who it's been a much-anticipated debut, and I don't want to get too over the top with my reaction because it is one game and one performance only to base this off. But everything you wanted to see out of Quinton Post, I think you saw in the limited game time that he had, of course, been dealing with that leg, uh, leg slash foot injury, whatever it was. Um, and he was on a minutes restriction, played 14 and a half minutes essentially. So limited game time, but I think you certainly saw enough signs to suggest that the Warriors might have a player on their hands here, probably more so for the future rather than the short term as in next season. But who knows? We saw what happened with Trace Jackson Davis last season. This guy, Quinton Post, he's 24 years old. So he's got obviously the extensive college experience in a similar vein to TJD and I mean coming into this you know without seeing too much of him obviously you are instantly intrigued by the combination of size and shooting the fact he's over seven foot the fact he shot in excess of 43 percent from three-point range in college last season that in itself is intriguing because one the Warriors do not have a seven footer on their roster and two they don't have a big man that can shoot on their roster so Instantly, it's like, okay, we got to see what this guy's about, what this guy can do. And the first thing I think you want to see is, okay, we see the percentages in college. We understand that. But does that translate to an NBA setting? And this is not obviously a proper NBA setting. This is a summer league. But still, you see players who shoot the ball really well in college, and that just doesn't necessarily translate to the pros. Well, you could see from this performance today that Quinton Post, his shooting certainly did translate. Two or four from three-point range, looked really comfortable with his shot, nailed his first one, which was kind of a pick and pop where, well, it wasn't really a pick and pop. He set a screen and then Spencer, uh, Pat Spencer kind of attacked, got into the paint and then kicked it back out, top of the key three, drilled it. Looked very comfortable, made another pick and pop three a little bit after that in the uh, late in the third quarter where that was a a genuine pick and pop in that scenario where Ethan Thompson found him for another three. So I I thought that, first of all, like that looks like it can translate. Good looking shot, uh, looked comfortable, looked aggressive in wanting to take them. Like I think the one he missed in, in the first half was like a trail three off a make where, you know, the Warriors were just bringing the ball down the floor and he kind of trailed the play. 
asked, uh, demanded the ball and then got it and put it up straight away, which at some times, like you say, that's an ill-advised shot. But if he's going to make them at a higher rate, like he made 50% today, then you're okay with that kind of thing. And it does give the Warriors something that they don't necessarily have. So the shooting looks like it's there. And again, that aspect, when you combine it with the seven-foot size, automatically makes you think, okay, okay, what like what can the Warriors potentially have on their hands here? His first bucket, his first shot in a Warrior uniform came from running the floor in transition, sealing his man, um, a, a smaller player in the in the paint, finishing over him. So that was that was nice to see him running the floor because I, I suppose that is the big question mark is obviously athletically speed and agility. And so for, again, for him to run the floor to show the the ability to obviously seal his man down low and then finish, we want to see a guy here hopefully who not only has the ability to extend to three-point range, but he's much more than just a three-point specialist at, 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 as a seven-footer. You want him to be able to do those seven-foot things where he does use his size in the paint, whether it's on post up against smaller players, whatever it may be. So that was nice to see. Looked generally pretty comfortable with the ball in his hands, like didn't handle the ball a whole lot, obviously, but there was one time where... He kind of, I think he got a rebound or a steal or whatever, and then he had to bring the ball across half court. Looked comfortable enough. There was a play in the fourth quarter where Pat Spencer kind of cut off ball and Post looked to find him and he turned the ball over. However, I think the fact he made that read and even tried that pass was actually a positive. Yes, he did turn the ball over, but again, making that read, trying to make that play, um, which is obviously going to be big. Like, you know, you've got to be able to. Um, make those kind of passes in the Warriors system in the, in the read and react Steve Kerr style. And so he does, you know, showcase a bit of the ability of again going back to college and we'll see more of this and, and how it plays out with the Warriors. But, you know, you go back to college, he averaged nearly three assists per game last season. He does show the ability to be able to pass. And that's obviously, as I said, going to be a huge thing for the Warriors. Defensively, solid. No highlight plays by any means. Like he averaged over a couple of blocks a game uh, in college last season. No blocks here, um, but solid nonetheless. And sometimes that's all it's about. It's not necessarily about the big, you know, shot blocking plays or anything like that. It's can you be solid within a team system, especially as a young player. Especially as a young player, you're just trying to make your way. That's what's going to be able to keep you on the floor. It's no good making, you know, one exciting block shot and then making four mistakes on defense straight afterwards. Steve Kerr is not going to live with that. So can you be solid? And I think he was solid, again, without making too many highlight plays. I think he did a good job on a number of occasions, kind of stunting at ball handlers on the pick and roll. I, I like that from him. He's obviously got the length to try and make up um, if, he, if he kind of spaces them a little bit. So I thought he did a pretty good job uh, a, a couple of times there. And then the only issue, there was a play in the second quarter where the Thunder got a three off a pick and pop where Post, again, with that kind of lack of agility, didn't quite get out to the shooter in the pick and pop scenario and, and had a, a three drilled in his face. That's probably going to be the the issue potentially is, again, that lack of, uh, that lack of agility and athleticism. So if you do come up against a shooting big, a player like himself, is he going to be able to cope defensively in that scenario? What I would say is, okay, you talk, you're, like, you're nitpicking there because you're talking about a young player who's going to be at best a backup big. How many backup bigs in the league are shooters kind of thing? Like how many shooting, like legitimately good shooting big men are there in the league in general, let alone guys that do that off the bench? So I don't see that as too much of a concern at this point. And uh, overall, I thought it was a solid display. Finished 10 points, three rebounds and assists and a steal. Four of seven shooting, two of four from three-point range. I don't want to get too excited. I don't want to go too over the top based on one performance, but he looked very comfortable. And I think for his first game in a in a Warrior uniform, you couldn't have really asked for much more. Like, looks like a legitimate offensive threat. Again, 10 points in less than 15 minutes is a very solid outing. And again, solid enough on defense without being too extraordinary, which is fine, which is fine. And I, I think overall, and I'm excited to you know see him play more 
moving forward here, obviously, hope he gets some run in the semi final, which you'd imagine he will. Hopefully, he can, you know, his minute restriction might get lifted up to to closer to twenty or something like that, and he can play a little bit more against the Heat on Sunday. Uh, but I think it's it's not overly surprising that he looks, you know, he looks so comfortable today because we do have to remember he is twenty four years of age. To put that into context, he's older than James Wiseman. James Wiseman just signed a contract with what the Indiana Pacers for his fifth season in the NBA and Quentin Post coming into his rookie year. Like he's older than James Wiseman. So some of the stuff that we were incredibly frustrated with going back to watching James Wiseman, which I don't want to harp on James Wiseman too much. He hasn't been on the team for 18 months, but some of the frustrating stuff that you saw with him, you're probably not going to see with Quentin Post because he has been able to have that time um, to develop and play significant minutes, play extensively, in college where he's been able to grow and develop in a similar way to TJD, right? TJD was able to come in straight away as the second last pick in last year's draft and come in and play a role straight away and be a guy who going forward from his second year onwards could potentially, you know, play 20, 25 minutes a game, could possibly be a starter. I don't think he will be necessarily, but Again, he's a guy that you know you could lock in to play 20, 25 minutes as a, a rim-running threat, a lob threat, pick-and-roll threat, and then a solid defensive, more than solid defensive player as well with his rim-protecting ability. So we'll see what happens with Quinton Post. The, the one thing that's super interesting about him is that he's yet to be contracted. He's not on a two-way yet, and he's not on the main roster, which is fascinating given they've got 14 guys on the main roster and that they've got their three, uh, there are loaded three two-way guys in Daquan Plowd and Reese Beekman and uh, and Pat Spencer. So it does leave a question mark on what's going to happen with Quinton Post. He is going to be either on a two-way deal or on the main roster, either way. I don't I have no doubts about that. The Warriors would not have draft him, wouldn't be playing him in some league. What, like, what Are they going to stash him and tell him to go play in Europe somewhere? Like That's not going to happen. That is not going to happen. He will be on the roster one way or another. I'm just wondering if they're waiting on this, the reason why they're waiting on this and the reason why they were happy to give Plowden a two-way deal instead of just giving it to Post straight up is because, again, maybe it's being a bit hopeful, maybe it's being optimistic, but I think there's an idea here that, hey, we think there could be a trade forthcoming in the next few weeks. If you just hold off, there could be a guaranteed roster spot for you and... You know, if they make a two for one or three for one, you know, if it's three for one trade where it's, I don't know, Pajemski, Moody, and GP2 or Loon for Markinen, for example, and they've got a couple of roster spots all of a sudden available, then maybe one of those does go to Quinton Post, where he signs a similar deal to TJD, where it's like four years, $8 million, and they get another really cheap guy at the, at the end of the roster there who they believe might not be at the end of the roster come a few months or a year or a couple of years or whatever, that he could be a really playable option for them. And it wouldn't be four years guaranteed. We're not so, like TJD, I think, has got his first two years guaranteed, then might be team option on the third and fourth years. I actually think like that's why they might be holding out right now is because they see that they could potentially have a couple of roster spots open in the coming weeks or whatever it may be. And they might just be asking Quinton Post, just hold off, just hold off. There could be a guaranteed spot for you. We just need to wait and see what happens. And if there isn't a guaranteed roster spot for you, we'll put you on a two-way. They will get rid of, I'd imagine, Reese Beekman. I'll speak about a bit more about that in a minute. But Quinton Post will be on the roster one way or another. But I do think it's interesting that the fact they haven't just automatically given him a two-way spot might be an indication that, perhaps a trade could be forthcoming and therefore a main roster spot could be open and they could put him on the main roster on a very cheap TJD-like contract, um, which if you are in any way a rotation player, <laughs> that is an incredibly valuable contract. Like Trace Jackson Davis, in terms of role players in the NBA, is on one of the most team-friendly contracts in the league. He's contracted for another three years and like $6.5 million. It's unbelievable. So can they try and do the same with Quinton Post? Absolutely. Especially, you've got to look at these guys. Like, when do we think TJD and Quinton Post are going to be in their prime? 27, 28 years old, maybe? Well, they're still going to be on their rookie contracts at that age, which is another reason why this is so valuable because you're getting them after four or five years of college experience. So they're already 23, 24 years old. They're already like somewhat probably close to their prime compared to a rookie that's 19, 20. And therefore, again, 
you're going to get so much value out of them on a rookie contract at less than $2 million, around $2 million a season, essentially. So anyway, um, the other big part of this game today against the Thunder was the performance of Pat Spencer, who backed up his very efficient, productive performance against the Cavaliers the other day with another very efficient performance today against the Thunder. 17 points, 8 of 10 shooting, another 7 assists. Very, very good. Very good. And before that Cavs game, I was kind of umming and ahhing about the whole Beekman-Spencer situation, assuming Post you know, is put on a two-way contract and one of those two guys would therefore probably have to go. And... I was thinking they might try and take the upside of Beekman, but no. <laughs> like watching Spencer in these last two games just has reiterated the fact that unfortunately Reese Beekman's probably going to be the one that misses out because I think Pat Spencer as quite an exp- like he's 28 years old, which does go against him in a degree, but it does also work for him in a degree because the Warriors need some more point guard options. And I didn't necessarily think he was this kind of – orchestrate the offense point guard and he's not he's not a traditional point guard in terms of like he's going to pound the rock all game and he's going to run a crap ton of pick and rolls like he's not that kind of point guard he's he will move the ball on i think that's great for the warrior system again like it's 0.5 basketball it's trying to get up and down it's trying to be fast um high tempo basketball i think that's great that's the way he plays if he sees a guy running in transition he will feed that guy Right, He's not a guy that's, okay, let's slow down the offense. Let me dribble the ball for 15 seconds. Then I'll run a pick and roll and see what we can get out of it. That's that's not his game. Like He's not a traditional point guard in that sense. In that sense. And I think that's good for the Warriors. And that's good for him in terms of the blend between his own style and the Warriors style. So I think his performances in the last two games have pretty much set in stone that he should be getting a two-way deal again next season. Now, will he be playing a whole lot? Probably not. I don't think so. But who knows? Like, if there's a Tuesday night game in Charlotte and Steph's resting, he might not be doing that in Charlotte because he's kind of from there and he wants to play against his brother in front of his dad and whatever else. But you get the drift. Then maybe Pat Spencer could be a backup point guard for 10, 15 minutes and you might be okay. That's that's all I'm saying. So, again, 28 years old, looks above the summer league level at this point, looks incredibly comfortable out there, running the offense efficiently in a manner that is still bringing his teammates to life rather than, again, holding the ball for 15 seconds and then running a pick and roll. So he was very, very good today, the the leader of the Warrior team, essentially, and um, just, again, sets in stone the fact that he'll be on a two-way contract, you'd imagine. Daquan Plowden, obviously, also on a two-way deal. Been speaking about him a lot throughout Summer League where he's been probably one of the most impressive players across the entirety of Summer League, not just for the Warriors. Not his best game today, uh, 13 points, 4 of 11 shooting. I think it was was it 2 of 7 from three-point range or something like that. But had a couple of massive plays late. He had that block in transition, which just showcased his athleticism immensely uh, with that chase down in the last two and a half minutes. And then in the last couple of minutes, he also had that put back dunk, which again showcased his athleticism. So been speaking about it at length. He's got a lot of physical traits that could lend itself to an NBA role in terms of shooting, athleticism, defense, being able to move off the ball. I, I really like him. And yes, it wasn't his his best game today, but he was still able to impact the game in a way um, that certainly helped the Warriors get the win down the stretch. In terms of other players, uh, Kevin Knox. Kevin Knox, he he got the player of the game, I think, on the, the Warriors' social media, which I don't agree with. Spencer was the player of the game for me. But Kevin Knox was good nonetheless, had some big buckets and some really strong rebounds in the fourth quarter, finished with the 14.10 rebound double-double. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I would like to see him in a good system. Has not really played for a winning organization in his six-year career today. Just think he deserves an opportunity in a good team. I'm not saying that it'll be the making of him and then he'll go on and have a 12, 14-year career. I'm not saying that. I just think that this summer league has shown that he at least deserves the opportunity. Now, whether will it be with the Warriors? Probably not. Probably not. But I think he could do worse for a 13th, 14th man. And I'll tell you, the more I watch Knox play and... The less I watched Guy Santos play, unfortunately he's not playing summer league because uh, he's obviously with Brazil preparing for the Olympics. 
is there is it is there an argument to be made that you should waive Guy Santos and bring Kevin Knox on board instead? Is there? I I don't think so. I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze, so to speak. I don't think it's worth it. I said on last episode, I don't I, I just I don't think that's worth it. But the more I watch Kevin Knox play, the more I think, hmm, yeah, maybe. Maybe. He certainly does a lot more stuff, I think, than Guy Santos does, right? Now, not all of that is good. And, you know, if he does end up on the Warriors, there's probably going to be plenty of times where, you know, he gets limited minutes or something and as fans, you're shaking your head, um, scratching your head, thinking what the hell is he doing or something like that. But there's going to be other times where he drills a three or something, a, a, a shot that Guy Santos wouldn't necessarily take or, you know, gets a strong rebound or something like that where you're like, okay, yep, I can see the value in this guy. And he's clearly got talent, like former ninth overall pick. Now, yes, we're going back six years, but he's got some talent. And I just, again, I think he's he deserves an opportunity to play in a good team. And the Warriors aren't necessarily – like the Warriors aren't a great team anymore. In fact, they'd be battling just to make the playoffs next season. But I think they're still a strong organization in comparison to who he's been with in the past, with a bad Knicks team back when he was there, the Pistons over the last couple of years, and he had that brief stint with the Portland Trailblazers as well. So I think he deserves the opportunity. Um, just before I go, I wanted to mention something about the Larry Markinen contract situation because this is something we haven't really dove into too much because it is hard to get your head around to an extent. I had someone in the comments the other day even mention it as well. So I think it's worth talking about. So there's this idea that in order to get a max contract, Larry Markin has to renegotiate his contract for next season. So if Larry Markin does remain at the Utah Jazz and agrees to an extension on August 6th, but the date he becomes eligible or after that, whatever point it may be, if he agrees to an extension with the Utah Jazz, it is probably going to be a renegotiation of this or next season's deal, which we know is only $18 million, where he will all of a sudden be making $33 million next season. And then he can extend and, and make and get a max contract off that automatically, right? So there's this idea that the Warriors would need to do the same thing, which automatically comp- complicates things when you're talking about, oh, so we need to trade for this guy, and we instead of giving him eighteen million next season, we need to give him thirty three. Okay, how do we make the salary work for that? And things get confusing. It wouldn't be as confusing because for the Warriors, if the Warriors traded for Laurie Markin, and this is um, going by what uh, GSW CBA on X slash Twitter posted about today, where if the Warriors trade for Laurie Markin, they will have him for eighteen million dollars next season. They will not renegotiate and extend they would just wait until next off season where he they can then hand him a max contract in franchi now does that does it increase the risk yes absolutely because what we're saying is you would not be able to make an extension straight away like you would with the jazz you could but again it gets complicated with having to try and have that salary available like you're going to have to have another 15 minutes. it would basically mean andrew wiggins you're out the door and not only are we getting rid of your twenty six million, but we can really only bring back like ten or eleven. Which, which, what, what team's going to do that? What team is going to do that? So I think it'd be hard for the Warriors to renegotiate and extend market. I just, I think it would be difficult because which team is taking on Wiggins' contract while only giving back ten or eleven million dollars? Where another team would essentially have to like just take Wiggins' contract off your hands without giving much salary in return. Obviously, I just don't see a team doing that. So as GW, uh, GWS, <laughs> GWS is a football team that had a win today, so good on them. Much better than Collingwood at the moment. Uh, GSW CBA on X slash Twitter. Um, again, they spoke about the fact that it wouldn't necessarily it wouldn't be a renegotiation and extent. It would be wait till Fredge where you can then offer Markinen a uh, a max contract, which again would increase the risk because you are taking it. You are letting him be an expiring contract essentially uh, where he could just walk in for agency. But again, you'd ha- when you trade for him, you'd have some assurance of you know talking to his camp and saying, okay, we can't renegotiate and extend with you right now, but make no mistake, we're going to offer you a max in for agency. And that max, again, according to GSW CBA, is five years, $269 million. That is the max for Laurie Markkinen. 
Now, I'm happy to be proven wrong if the Warriors do find a way to be able to renegotiate and extend. Maybe they do a deal. I, I just don't see I don't see Utah taking on Wiggins. Like there's a way that Utah could just take the thirty three million like take thirty three million dollars in salary. Let's say it's Wiggins, uh, Wiggins, Pods, and Moody, and a couple of picks or whatever it is, and they only send Markin in return, right? Or it's Markin and Walker Kessler, whatever. It is. Let's just, let's just say it's Markin. Then the Warriors would have the salary space potentially to be able to renegotiate and extend. I just don't see Utah taking Wiggins' contract. So I'm happy you proven wrong on the whole renegotiate and extend aspect. I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, I think the more likely is that they just play it out and then they offer from a long way out, they basically say, yeah, look, we're going to give you a max in for agency. And then there's some assurances from Markkinen's side that, yes, we will sign that. In a similar vein to Pascal Siakam with the, the Indiana Pacers last season. So that was the last thing I kind of wanted to mention on that because it is a complicated factor and there is a lot of people that think, oh, well, the Warriors need to find a way to renegotiate and extend him. The other... The big, the best thing that could happen with the Warriors, the best thing that could happen is if they trade for him and say, look, we would like to extend you now, but we can't give you the max, like because they'd be limited in being able to give him that $33 million extension or whatever else. The best thing that would, could happen for the Warriors is Markin actually agrees to not a max contract, that he actually is willing to sign an extension with the Warriors, which is only just above $30 million a season rather than the five-year 269 over $50 million a season. That would be absolutely unreal for the Warriors, would be an absolute steal. I just That's not going to happen either. Markkinen's going to want the max, and I think any team that trades for him is probably going to have to understand that. Again, happy to be proven wrong on any of these points, but I think just the way it's kind of all looking at the moment and the difficulty of renegotiation and extension and the difficulty of trying to get Markkinen to agree to anything less than a max contract I think the best, the, the most likely outcome would be the, if the Warriors trade for marketing is they leave it until free agency and they offer him a max there. So anyway, I'll finish it up there. Thank you very much for listening or watching wherever you may be uh, viewing this or, again, listening to this on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, that would be greatly appreciated. You can follow me at POC252. That's P O K. 252 on X slash Twitter. I'll be back again in a couple of days. No doubt there'll be some more news, of course. If there is any breaking news on the Laurie Market and stuff, then you can uh, see the breaking breaking news over on bluemanhoop.com. If it happens during the middle of the night for me, I'll be very, very disappointed, but uh, I'll have some colleagues that will be able to cover it over there. Uh, and otherwise, I'll be sure to cover it here as well as soon as I can. Other than that, guys, thanks again for watching or listening, and I'll see you on the next episode.